This is the third part of my talk about models of the Renogram. In the first part I explained what a Renogram is and talked about the kidney and in part two I showed some models of the Renogram. In part three I'm going to talk about the radiopharmaceuticals that can be used for renography and show how the nephron model allows us to explain how the kidneys handle each radiopharmaceutical. Let's remind ourselves of the processes that take part in the kidney. There are four processes that are relevant to renography. First is glomerular filtration. This is a passive process. Any molecule that is small enough to pass through the glomerular membrane will be filtered regardless of its chemical nature. It just depends on the size. And the rate depends on the pressure difference across the glomerulus, a hydrostatic pressure driving it through the glomerulus. On the other hand, tubular secretion and tubular reabsorption are active processes that only take place for selected molecules, molecules that the body wants to get rid of or to retain. Water reabsorption is also important uh, and this just depends on the osmotic pressure difference between the tubules and the peritubular tissues and that osmotic pressure difference is created by concentration gradients due to molecules that have been uh, reabsorbed by the kidneys. So that is working in the opposite direction to the hydrostatic pressure in the glomerulus which is forcing water into the tubules. This osmotic pressure difference uh, extracts water out of the tubules. So we need to look at how different radiopharmaceuticals used for inography are handled uh, because they're handled in different ways. And we're going to talk about technetium 99M labeled DTPA, technetium 99M labeled MAG3, and I123 labeled Hippuran. Let's look at our nephron model of the kidney to explain what's going on. We have blood coming into the renal artery and passing out through the renal vein. And at the glomerulus, filtrate can pass uh, down into the renal tubules, down the loop of Henle, back up um, to the distal tubule, and then down into the collecting ducts where it comes out in the urine through the ureter. So glomerular filtration takes place uh, at the glomerulus. As we said, that's a passive process that will happen for any molecule that is small enough. Tuber secretion an active process for selected molecules may take additional molecules from the blood into the filtrate. And tubular reabsorption, which can take place in the loop of Henle um, and the distal renal tubule, can reabsorb selected molecules that the body wants to retain. Water reabsorption takes place in the descending limb of the loop of Henle um, and in the distal tubule and in the collecting ducts um, and this is ultimately what determines how much urine you produce. So let's uh, look at how the kidneys handle water. Water is part of plasma so it will come into the kidney at a rate equal to the renal plasma flow which is about 660 mils a minute and pass through the blood and come out in the renal vein. But it's a small molecule so it's freely filtered and the filtration rate uh, is normally about 125 mils a minute. That amount of water will pass into the tubules but a lot of it is reabsorbed. About 123 mils a minute of water are reabsorbed um, and that leaves only about 2 mils a minute coming out in the urine during our normal waking hours. So the kidney is working really hard in reabsorbing all that water that it's filtered. So it's important to realize that the kidneys are continuously processing water. Um, when we inject a radiopharmaceutical for a renogram, it's not that the kidneys suddenly wake up and start processing the radiopharmaceutical. No, they've been working hard processing water all the time. All we do is add some radiopharmaceutical and observe what's happening because we can see the radiopharmaceutical being carried through uh, the kidneys. In exactly the same way as um, in the plastic ducts model, the river was flowing all the time, but we only saw how fast it was going when we added the marker of the yellow plastic ducts. 
and in that analogy we have to assume that the number of plastic ducts added to the river isn't sufficient to block it and change the flow and in exactly the same way with the renogram we assume that the amount of radio pharmaceutical added is so small that it doesn't disturb the normal functions of the kidney and that's pretty true because with nuclear medicine we can fortunately add very very small tracer quantities of radio pharmaceutical which uh, don't disturb the normal flow in the kidney at all. So if we look at uh, DTPA this is one of the radio pharmaceuticals that we use for renography um, it will also enter the kidneys at a rate equal to the renal plasma flow um, but it's a small molecule which is filtered but there's no active secretion and no active reabsorption. So it gets into the filtrate at a rate equal to the glomerofiltration rate which is about 125 mils a minute. Because there's no secretion and no reabsorption it just gets carried through the kidneys by the water and it's excreted in the urine. So the clearance rate, the rate at which it disappears from the blood, is by definition equal to the glomerofiltration rate. That means its extraction efficiency of 125 over 660 is about 20%. Um, only one-fifth of what enters the renal artery um, comes out in the urine. Um, the rest comes, goes straight through and comes out the renal vein. So DTPA can be labelled with the radionuclide technetium 99M to make a radiopharmaceutical that is suitable for renography. On the other hand, if we look at um, other molecules, um, OIH, also iodohypuric acid, which is called hipuran, and PAH, paraaminohypuric acid, also enter the kidney at a rate equal to the renal plasma flow. They're filtered, but also actively secreted but with no reabsorption. So they undergo glomerofiltration and tubular secretion, but with no reabsorption, they're then carried through the tubule by the water and excreted in the urine. This means that they're quite effectively cleared from the blood because the tubular secretion is in a very efficient process for these molecules. In fact, PAH has an extraction efficiency of 90%. So 90% of what comes in through the renal artery comes out in the urine only 10% exits through the renal vein. and In fact, that's because 10% of the renal blood flow doesn't go to the glomeruli at all. It goes to perfuse the renal capsule to keep the kidney alive. So the um, rate at which pH is cleared is known as the effective renal plasma flow. It's the amount of renal plasma that does go to the glomeruli. And that's about 600 mils a minute. PAH can be used by physiologists to measure effective renal plasma flow. Its disappearance from the blood gives a measure of the ERPF. But unfortunately, it's not easy to label it with any radionuclide that is suitable for gamma camera use, and therefore it doesn't form a pharmaceutical that can be used for renography. Hipuran, which is what we can use in renography, OIH, has a rather lower extraction efficiency of only 65%, which is perhaps rather disappointing, but this is because some of the hipuran is bound to protein molecules, and the protein molecules are too big to be filtered, and so that reduces the extraction efficiency of hipuran compared with PAH. OIH differs from PAH in that it has an iodine group in the ortho position of the benzene ring instead of an amine group in the para position. However, the iodine makes it much more suitable for nuclear medicine use because we can replace the stable iodine with a radioactive isotope of iodine that can be detected by the gamma camera. In the early days of renography, iodine-131 was used to label hipuran. This was very suitable for external probe counting, but not suitable for gamma cameras unless you used a very high energy collimator. Nowadays, we would prefer to use iodine-123, which has a much more suitable gamma-ray energy for gamma camera imaging. Uh, therefore, I-123 labelled hipuran makes an ideal radio pharmaceutical for gamma camera rhinography because uh, it's high extraction efficiency. MAG-3 also enters the kidney at a rate equal to the renal plasma flow 
and it undergoes filtration but it also has some protein binding so the filtration is somewhat reduced um, there is some secretion but no reabsorption so uh, it's filtered there is secretion no reabsorption means it's carried through the tubules by the water and excreted in the urine but his extraction efficiency of 45 percent is less than hippuran but better than DTPA so the clearance is somewhere greater than the GFR of 120 mils a minute less than the ERPF of 600 mils a minute it's about 300 mils a minute which is between those two so MAG3 can be labelled with technetium 99M to form a radiopharmaceutical that's suitable for rhinography with an extraction efficiency that is better than DTPA but not as good as Hippuran. So if we look at the radiopharmaceuticals that can be used for rhinography, 99M technetium labelled DTPA, which is known as pentatate, is cleared by filtration only. This is good if you want to measure glomerular filtration rate, GFR, because by taking blood samples and seeing how quickly it disappears from the blood, you can get a measure of the glomerular filtration rate. It can also be used for rhinography because, of course, technetium 99M has good imaging properties for the gamma camera, and the DTPA is not bound in the kidney. So this is a radiopharmaceutical that can be used for rhinography, but because its extraction efficiency is rather low at 20%, not much appears in the kidney, quite a lot is left in the blood, so the kidney to background ratio is rather poor. On the other hand, technetium 99M labelled MAG3 metiotide um, undergoes filtration, although this is reduced by protein binding, and some secretion. So it's good for inography because it's got a better extraction efficiency than a DTPA at 45%. That means there's more in the kidney, less in the blood, and so you get a good kidney to background ratio. Iodine-123 labelled Hippuran is cleared by filtration and very good secretion, and therefore it's excellent for rhinography because the high extraction efficiency of 65% gives you a lot in the kidney, very little left in the blood, and so you get an excellent kidney to background ratio. I123 has good imaging properties for the gamma camera and so it would be excellent for rhinography but unfortunately it's too expensive for routine use because iodine 123 is cyclotron produced and that makes it expenses and limited availability. So in summary we saw that the renogram is a diagnostic nuclear medicine procedure to investigate kidney function. It produces curves showing how the injected radiopharmaceutical passes through each kidney and those curves represent a superposition of three things. Uptake from blood into the kidney, transit through the kidney and elimination into the bladder. So the renogram curve is actually quite a complicated curve. In talking about the radiopharmaceutical use, we saw that technetium DTPA is cheap but it has poor kidney to background ratio. Technetium labelled MAG3 is more expensive, but it's got better kidney to background ratio. Whereas I123 Hippuran has an excellent kidney to background ratio, but is too expensive for routine use. So that's the end of this talk on models of the renogram.